All right, let's go ahead and get started for our next presentation. We have David and Fabian talking about keeping track of CentOS infrastructure with Ansible and Ara. So thank you all for, for presenting today, and I will get out of your way. Switch, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, so let's get started. Um, let me find the right window here. This one. No. Zoom in. Can I? Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, just uh, before we start, I wanted to quickly introduce myself. Uh, I am a Red Hatter. I'm, our, I'm part of the uh, Ansible community team. Um, so I, I work with the upstream Ansible project trying to help uh, people merge code uh, faster and make it easier for people to contribute. Um, Historically, I've been working around the, the CI CD uh, niche uh, for quite a long time. I was in the OpenStack community before uh, working with tooling, uh, project hosting. Uh, it turns out that um, um, you know merging code is not just about uh, GitHub. There's a lot of pieces around it uh, to you know <laughs> make it possible for the community to chat with each other and contribute. Um, so yeah, that's that. Fabian, did you want to quickly say? Who you, were, who you are? Well, quickly, as I did it already yesterday. So if you don't know who I am, well, it's your fault. You should be present uh, yesterday for the other talk. But I'm um, basically just working in the CentOS Infra for quite some years now. Um, and so involved into everything regarding Infra and deployment there. So um, that's why we'll cover um, how we use uh, Aura with Ansible for the CentOS Infra. Yep, thank you. Um, so a fairly uh, simple uh, agenda. Uh, I am someone who likes uh, simple things. Uh, I'll tell you about Ara, uh, what it is, and also what it's not. Um, you know, finding this disinformation and all that. I'll tell you a little bit about what it does, uh, how it works, and um, how you can get started. Um, uh, and then um, Fabian will follow up. So after the introduction about ARA itself, we'll see how we decided to use ARA in the CentOS in, uh, Infra. But how we wanted to consume it, that triggers another operation through the configuration management SIG regarding RPM packaging of, of the solution and so some of the container solution that we initially uh, use for it. But of course, that will be in the second part of the talk. Thank you. Uh, so Ara, uh, what it is? Uh, it is five years old uh, this month. Uh, I should. Uh, I, I need to find somewhere to make a, a nice cake that I'll eat by myself because of this pandemic, and I cannot share it with you know <laughs> other users and such. Uh, it is uh, another recursive acronym, uh, amongst other things. Uh, some people call it uh, Ansible runtime analysis. Some people call it uh, Ansible reporting API. Some people call it um, uh, Ara records uh, Ansible, uh, which is uh, what seems to have stuck, uh, you know, over the years. Uh, it is a free and open source uh, Ansible community project. Uh, it's on GitHub. Um, I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, it's packaged uh, for a myriad of distros. Uh, it's uh, the uh, the upstream, let's say, is on PyPy. Uh, there are Fedora packages for it. There is uh, CentOS packages, which we'll tell you about today. Um, and it turns out it's also packaged on Debian and OpenSUSE if you're into that. Um, it's uh, we the, the project publishes container images that are you know fairly simple, but include all the batteries that you need to get going. Uh, it's the same image. Uh, it's available on Docker Hub and Quay.io. Uh, there are links here, so I figure uh, if the slides are uh, made available, uh, you will be able to click on those. Um, what it is not. Um, Ara is not something that you can run your playbooks with. It is as, um, let's say, uh, as little invasive as possible. It doesn't change the way that you run your playbooks today, whether you're running it from a CLI with Ansible playbook or from your bash scripts or from Jenkins or from uh, even AWS or Tower. Uh, it, it doesn't change how you, you actually run your playbooks. It's something that you know uh, runs in the background, let's say. Uh, it is not a replacement for AWS and Tower. I feel the need to call this out because some people will say, well, why would you use uh, A when you have B or the other way around? Um, again, uh, Ara doesn't run the playbooks for you, so it just does the reporting. Um, so it is not a replacement, and it's not mutually exclusive. 
Um, it's not something that parses your Ansible console output. So when you run an Ansible playbook, you have you know this output in your console. Um, it doesn't parse that. It's uh, it uses uh, an Ansible plugin, uh, which has uh, access to much more than the console output, uh, actually. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, what it does, <laughs> it makes Ansible easier to understand and troubleshoot. So Ansible, you know, at um, at a base level is, is meant to be simple. You write this YAML, these, these playbooks, these roles, um, and it's pretty simple to get started. Uh, you kind of start to lose track of things when you start running hundreds of playbooks every day against hundreds or even thousands of hosts uh, on a regular basis, whether that's from CI CD or from your laptop. Um, so, you know, it, when you start running at a certain scale, uh, it's important to have uh, some simple reporting, and you know that's what uh, R does. Um, so what it does, in fact, is to record um, uh, playbook results to a SQLite, uh, MySQL, or PostgreSQL database. Um, underneath, it's Django, so um, you know it, it doesn't do anything special. Uh, Django supports those those out of the box, and you know it's just an abstraction basically. Um, it provides an API for playbook task uh, and host results. So once the results are in the database, it makes it easy to um, expose all of that information uh, through an API, uh, which you can then query to you know, uh, fetch me the results that failed or fetch me uh, the results for this host and so on. Um, and then once you have an API, well, you can build stuff uh, around this API. Uh, so we have uh, a, a, um, a simple re reporting interface um, that you can run from your laptop. You know, you don't need like a full-blown server or anything. Um, and then uh, there's a CLI that allows you to query um, and search for things. Um, so how, how does it work? Um, so you have a human. We can substitute that for any tool tooling of your choice that launches a playbook. Um, it leverages a callback plugin uh, in Ansible. So for every hook, every time, every time that something happens throughout the execution of your playbook, um, you'll, there, there's going to be a hook to the callback plugin. So R leverages those hooks to save data into a database. Um, so there's uh, the callback takes care of sending that to the server. Server saves that to the database. And then you know it returns, and it, it the, the the playbook keeps on on running. Um, something that I do want to point out here is that um, the API server does not need to be running for you to be recording data. So again, with the with the uh, objective of simplicity, um, it was very important for me to uh, not need to run an API server uh, because then you need a service, you need to run it somewhere, you need a server. Uh, no, by default, there's uh, an offline uh, implementation that takes care of spinning up an ephemeral server. Uh, so you don't need to worry about that You know, if you don't have the use case for um, a dedicated server instance. <laughs> so I've told you a, a lot of things, actually. And you know, it, I like to say it's simple. Uh, but no, really, uh, how does it work? So I told you about uh, these uh, Ansible callback plugins. Um, and this is uh, th these are some of the hooks that are exposed. There are some other ones, uh, but those are the, the ones that Hara mostly cares about. Um, so you know, when a playbook starts, it, it will create a playbook in the uh, in the database, and then when the task starts, it will save the task and associate it with the playbook, and so on and so forth. Um, the reason why I I want to tell you about this is. This is just uh, Python code, um, and you can have anything in there. Any any Python, uh, you can have your own callback plugins if you want to. Um, Ara just happens to leverage those to uh, not print more data to the console because that's some that's what some Ansible callbacks do. They print some additional output or change how the output that is rendered on the console. Uh, Ara doesn't actually print anything uh, to the console. It, um, it it just does stuff in the background that you it doesn't um, you don't need to pay attention to. Um, so yeah, that's that's really uh, how it works. Uh, getting started, <laughs> I, I was hearing some 
uh, some uh, words about PIP uh, in the hallway chat earlier. Uh, yes, so <laughs> um, it's it's not. Uh, we'll we'll get into RPM packaging uh, afterwards, uh, but it's available on PyPy. So you would install uh, Ansible and Ara uh, with the uh, API server dependencies. Not again, not that the server needs to be running, but if you'll be recording data locally, uh, you need to have the server dependencies installed. Um, once uh, Ansible and Ara are installed, um, you tell um, Ansible A uh, load callback plugins from this location. So really, what this command does is it just prints a path. It doesn't actually do anything. It prints a path to where the Ara callback plugin is. And the reason why this exists is because depending on the distro that you use to install uh, Ara, or depending where, whether it's used uh, as an RPM or from PIP or inside a virtual environment and so on, the location is going to change. Um, so th this command knows where the callback is. So it just, you know, it's, it's a helper command, basically. Um, then you run your playbook, as you usually would. Uh, and that's it. It's recorded in a local SQLite database. Uh, you can start querying stuff. Uh, and you can uh, spin up uh, a local uh, development server so you can browse stuff you know, from your laptop if you want to. But now we've got you know, it, it's packaged in the CentOS 8 um, configuration management uh, repos. So if you're not into pip, you can <laughs> install the, the configuration management SIG repo uh, from, from where you'll be able to install um, uh, Ansible and Ara. And after that, it's basically the same thing, right? You you tell you need to tell Ansible, hey, there's a, a callback here for you, um, and that's it. So hopefully, you know that's simple enough. Um, um, some some more reading and links uh, if you uh, if you want to know more. Um, but other than that, I'll leave it to uh, Fabian. Um, so there's a live demo here. I don't know if we'll we'll have the time to to go uh, to do a live demo today. But otherwise, I, I invite you to, to check that out. Uh, it's a live instance that you can play with. Uh, otherwise, you know we have a blog. Uh, the code is on GitHub. We have some docs here. Uh, if you want to come uh, chat with us or uh, stay up to date, there's, uh, there's a Twitter account here. Uh, we are on Freenode. Uh, and there's even the Slack if you know, you're not an IRC person. <laughs> Uh, it's, it, it is bridged to IRC, so people can chat with each other. Um, but I recognize that you know, in 2021, not everyone is a fan of IRC. Um, and with that, um, I will leave it to our fab. Thank you, David. So if you can just uh, stop presenting, I will it from my side. Yes, yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> uh, here you go. Here you go. OK, let me select. Uh, and here we go. So um, let's, let's start with a little bit of background, so history uh, from, from the CentOS infra perspective. So it's, um, it's not a secret that we were coming from Babbit before switching to Ansible some time um, ago. Um, oh, I see some people mentioning that my audio is bad. Is that better? I don't change anything on my side. Oh. If if you reload, it might help. Um, I've that's that's fixed a couple times today for me. You want me to leave and rejoin? Yeah, let's try that. Let's try that. I had to switch from Firefox to Chromium just before the presentation because it was choppy as well. Uh, while Fabian uh, joins us back, I uh, invite you to use the Q&A feature if you want to ask any questions. Uh, we'll get to it. Yeah, let's, let's try again. Is the audio better? It's all clear to me, Fabian. 
it's amusing because I haven't changed anything. And I was just chatting with the other guys just in the other session without, anyway. Ah, demos, demo. I, I forgot to pray the demo god today. Sorry, let me just share again my screen. Technology is hard. It is, on especially on a Friday. <laughs> so let's start again, a little bit of background. So we were using um, Puppet. Uh, I remember clearly when personally I started to contribute to the CentOS project. Uh, I migrated myself to Puppet Infra from Puppet 023 to 024, and then 2.5, 2.6, etc. Et so um, just to let you to give you a little bit of details, um, in when we were running Puppet, we liked the idea of having a central machine, Puppet Master D, that all the Puppet agents in the center so far were just doing a check-in on a regular basis, just to see if there was a new catalog to apply, manifest. And uh, we also liked uh, the fact that we were using Foreman. Uh, Foreman can be used for plenty of things, including deployment first, but also as an external node classifier for puppets, meaning that uh, all the reports coming from a puppet agent were uploaded back to the Foreman server, and that was giving you some nice reports about what was changed, if the machine were in the um, in the correct state because you declared the state, and um, and um, and that was really really interesting. Uh, we really liked that feature when we were using Puppet. So the idea of regular checking and report through a simple dashboard if you wanted to have a look at. So not needed, but nice to have. So with that in mind, let's see how we uh, decided to migrate uh, some time ago from Puppet to Ansible. So we were already using uh, Ansible for plenty of orchestration, ad hoc orchestration tasks, even just to orchestrate Puppet uh, uh, agent apply, Puppet agent apply uh, code on various machine uh, or do some, some automation. But um, we really appreciate the um, simplicity of Ansible code, like probably a lot of people were um, doing. And so we decided to move completely from Puppet to, to Ansible. Um, and in, before um, diving into plenty of things like reporting, etc., we decided to just con um, concentrate and focus on um, Ansible the engine, because that's where, as sysadmin and infra team, you just want to put all your logic. Um, and if you are happy with the skeleton, then you can just add more things on top. So, um, uh, because uh, the infra team was really small and is still small, so Brian Stinson and me, we just had some proposal back and forth, the two of us, just to say, let's do something like, let's just have for Ansible inventory as Git repository and multiple inventory based on the environment, like production, staging, or even um, CentOS CI uh, is its own Ansible um, uh, inventory so that people can just have access there, but not in the other part of the infra based on access control, for example. We uh, also decide for the inventory to have um, uh, some things Git crypted. So, and recently for uh, a new project, we decided to embrace uh, and use Ansible Vault. Um, that's for the inventory part. All the playbooks um, and the requirements file uh, to, to be able to run the playbooks everywhere, so the dependency on all the roles, are all on also one central Git repository. So all the inventory are using just one central Git repository for the, the playbooks. And all the roles are just their own uh, Git project, meaning that uh, it was possible for us to do some cherry picking based on the environment to say, for this kind of environment, I would like, I need these roles that we, we need. So there is a requirement in the YAML file for this. For the other one, it's another one. Um, for example, simple, um, if you have a look at all the roles on github.com slash centers, you will see that all the Ansible role have also a staging branch. And of course, you will understand easily that in a staging environment, it's pulling the role from the staging branch everywhere and so on and so on. If you are interested in just into that skeleton, just go to um, to the, 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 the main um, GitHub page and uh, everything is there, uh, except of course the inventory, which are uh, elsewhere. Otherwise, all the playbooks and all the roles are public for the, the, the world centers in front. But once we were happy with that and that we converted plenty of uh, role from Puppet to, to Ansible and that we also roll, um, we, we had um, new roles coming, in the center infra, we thought about this was cool to still have something a la Puppet or a la Foreman, uh, meaning something that we would run on a regular basis. So we, we then kicked our project just to have 
um, a central management machine that would have everything and um, just execute on a regular basis um, the, the, the YAML file everywhere. Uh, the, the playbooks, etc. So um, the idea is that uh, that machine is contacting all the machine just to have a, the we do the fact caching uh, on that machine and just contact all the machine and apply all the possible role that we have. Um, while it was working, we just enable the lock feature of Ansible just just to have central log uh, of what was happening everywhere. But still, um, there was a need just to have something really cool and. And that's how we found um, Aura. Um, and uh, I discovered that from uh, the, the center of CI days where David was working uh, in audio and they were doing plenty of, of testing and um, it was all Ansible based, uh, but also then the, I saw the reporting, the, the first iteration of Aura and how it evolved over the years. So uh, one thing that uh, I always consider really a must is Keep it stupid and simple everywhere, all the time, if possible. Don't don't over engineer things. Don't put extra layers in your infra. Like if people tell you of telling you just do this, like deploy open Kubernetes, OpenShift, whatever, just have a look at your needs. And this is exactly how we we, we decided to do for Ansible also. Um, we didn't want to plug components that were really invasive into Ansible code itself. Just one example, um, um, if you don't know Mitogen, the, the talk is not about Mitogen, but just an example. Mitogen is really, really great just to speed up your playbook execution time, especially when you have plenty of machine all around the world, which is the case for CentOS Infra. So um, with a keep it stupid and simple approach, even our Ansible machine is managed by Ansible, and this is the Jinja 2 template for Ansible of CFG, you will see clearly that it's just, it just like use mitogen through or, or false, it's just a Boolean. Meaning that in case of suddenly in the future, at the moment everything works fine, but eventually mitogen would not support or work with a new version of Ansible, just a Boolean to turn off. It doesn't change Ansible code itself. So I really like non-invasive add-on because of course you, you have less dependency and you can also always go back to previous states. So, this is exactly the case with Ara, as uh, David uh, was mentioning. It's non-invasive because it's just using callback plugins, so native callback plugin from from Ansible, and you can write your Python code. So this is exactly the same thing in our machine. Is do we want to Ansible use Ara through false or so Boolean? If through, yeah, just just declare the callback plugin location, um, and and as an Ara client, just report to that machine, meaning a specific port on the machine itself. So it's really easy, something you can turn on, off when you want. You can turn it, you can have it on your laptop, you can have it on central machine, a machine which is our case. But then the, the fun uh, began because um, uh, as David mentioned, um, it was part of Fedora as an European package, but not uh, in Enterprise Linux 8, so not in Apple 8. Um, there was a, a part due to Python 3 code and plenty of dependencies. Um, which are in Fedora, uh, we don't look and um, it's already in Apple 8, but just at the client part, because you can you can have Aura, as David mentioned, just um, that you use for the callback plugin and you can report to, that can be a central machine, even for Aura if you have multiple hosts. So that part was already done and we rebuilt quickly through the configuration management SIG. Then, um, I had a look at what was needed because plenty of package were not, um, uh, rebuilt yet for Apple 8 um, and just had a look at the dependencies. Um, that was the goal. And then when it would be done, just rebuild Ara with the server support through the configuration management SIG. So um, it takes time. So for from a CentOS infra point of view and not configuration management point of view, um, uh, I started to, with something stupid and simple again. Like we had already the Ara client part package as RPM in the infra in the configuration management SIG. So um, I think that was my first contribution to, to Ara, just providing a, um, a, the, the server part that would just be using a CentOS 8 container. We should switch that to CentOS 8 stream, by the way. <laughs> That's another pull request coming, David, soon. Um, that would just get the package from pip um, and you 
you could just like with Bodman, which is what we used uh, as an unprivileged user, run the server part while Ansible and the callback were just called locally and reporting to that um, uh, the container. So you can have a look at the Ansible role. So um, all the Ansible role in the center synchro start with Ansible role something. So this is amusing because for Ansible, that means Ansible role, Ansible host, which is the, the, the role for the management station. Then uh, this is really like just for fun. I paste uh, the full list is on the issue tracker on GitHub uh, for hour, by the way, the number of packages were required um, just for the whole packaging and the testing during the build process of the package for uh, the, the server part. So yeah, I will not cover that in due details. This was just to show that that was um, a lot of work, especially when you do that uh, on your spare time. So I was happy that I was able to just use a container with Bondman and it took some time, but a few moments later, meaning basically when I had nothing to do on a Sunday afternoon when it was raining and it happens quite a lot in Belgium. Finally, I was able to, to have uh, all the components built um, in uh, CBS, that center the rogue, and so be able to rebuild the RPM package. And what about now? Well, David showed you already, right? but it's just like pretty straightforward. Just install CentOS release Ansible 2.9, uh, which will give you access to the repository and the GPG key for Ansible 2.9 and ARA uh, packages there. So uh, just install it. There is a very small variant with what um, David showed present, uh, previously. Um, I just, uh, it's based on its recommendation, by the way, using G. Unicorn to start um, um, a multi-worker process for, for Django uh, in case you need to report uh, to, to have plenty of uh, Ansible callback plugin reporting to the Django. Um, because it runs on the central station and not on, on your laptop, this is something that should run all the time. And, and this is just a stupid systemd file uh, that is not provided in the package, but that um, is in a role, but that David has also a role. If you have a look on the official documentation, and uh, David has a role just to deploy also Aura. Um, and this is an example of a systemd unit file you can use to start automatically uh, the Aura server path with Django. With Django. So um, one thing that um, we started with just to evaluate and it's still working fine. Um, keep it stupid and simple. So just for the Ansible host, this is a machine that we would like to eventually move quickly, reinstall if in case of failure, whatever. Um, um, SQLite is easy to start with. And I was surprised that even after some time, um, just a, sing a, sing a single SQLite file on the file system for the, um, the central management station, is enough um, and uh, so never considered moving to MySQL, MariaDB or Postgres because um, the way we run the, the playbooks on a regular basis is done in a serial mode anyway. So it's not like if we have plenty of process uh, with still only uh, Django and, um, and R accessing the SQLite, but um, it's, it's not a, a big issue and that has never been an issue for us so far. So we still use um, SQLite. Um, mandatory screenshot, but it will be probably better for David to give a real demo, but this is a screenshot of the, which is probably not readable <laughs> on this size, um, of what, what's happening uh, on a daily basis uh, in the, the CentOS infra and um, uh, for all the roles that are called on all the host, uh, just to check for compliance that everything is working fine, nobody changed anything and, and uh, the machine is in the correct state. So it's not really readable, but what we also like is um, just to have some uh, reporting or, on, or just some trigger on, through Zabbix, because we also do monitoring on Zabbix when um, we, put, we push a specific file after each execution on the machine. So, uh, and in Zabbix, we check that. So we know when a machine was not configured and when not touched, configured by Ansible, or not verified by Ansible. Um, so we can just do something like simple query, like uh, there is a CLI part, and this is just a stupid example that I took this morning. Um, so it's last minute change in, in the um, in the uh, in the slide, just to show you. Oh, I would like to know the, the playbook execution that failed. So you see, uh, th there is one that is refresh facts, which is like contacting all the machine and just do caching of all the. Um, the, the, um, the, the, the variables and the, the facts on the Ansible O so that for the next execution, it doesn't have to go through the gather uh, fact step, 
uh, and we also use the, um, uh, the the fact caching. So this is something you should consider if you don't use it already. It speed ups a lot. And there is also another one which, which is failing. And I just had a look this morning, and this is because one machine, uh, which was also confirmed by uh, Ansible, uh, by uh, Zabbix monitoring, which, which is at the moment down, and the machine is, Ansible, of course, is trying to connect, but the machine is unreachable, which is, in fact, normal at this stage. So, and if people were just wondering what Tobizna is in that path location, well, it's just, just to me being stupid with uh, an Ansible bot and doing some crazy name based on it. So this is just for fun. And I think this is the end of the, the presentation for me. Uh, and so if you have question, uh, David, uh, David will be able to answer all the question. <laughs> right. Maybe some questions for you too, Fabian. Don't, don't run away just yet. <laughs> um, yeah, let me read through the Q and A, uh, right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, Miguel asks, um, what about the migration from Ansible 2 to 3? Have you upgraded already? It seems that we're having the same behavior in Ansible like in Puppet in regards of redo of the DSL. Um, so I'll put my Ansible community hat on. Uh, I have many hats of which you can see in the background here. Um, so Ansible 3 is actually not um, a groundbreaking change in the sense that uh, um, over, over the past two years or so, Ansible has been, uh, the, the Ansible uh, GitHub repo has been broken up um, beyond 2.9. So starting with 2.10, you had the Ansible base, which was the equivalent of the GitHub repo, and then Ansible collections a little bit all around, um, included in the Ansible 2.10 and uh, in the Ansible 2.10 package. So when we started using Ansible 3, which was released uh, back in March, I believe, uh, and we'll have Ansible 4, in fact, uh, very soon uh, next week. So this is the Ansible package, which is the aggregation of the Ansible core and the Ansible collections around that provide all the plugins and modules. Uh, and we've moved to semantic versioning as a way to control and um, signal the backwards compa compatibility or lack thereof, right? So whenever we bump from Ansible 3 to 4, it's a signal, you know, there, there, might, some, there might be some breaking changes in here. Um, so meanwhile, the core of Ansible is staying on their current versioning scheme. So for example, um, a week or two ago, there was Ansible core to 11 that released. And there's no change, there's no big changes in the language or anything. And I don't think there's uh, any significant refactor like that in the works. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, yeah, and, and Miguel, if your question was more about uh, from the CentOS side, from the CentOS infra side, um, no, not yet. Um, if you, it's probably, uh, you could see that from the, um, the screenshot, uh, the Ansible version is, is shown in through ARA, so you can you see which version, which is at the moment 2.9.21, which is the latest version if the 2.9 branch. We haven't m uh, migrated yet because I we all had a quick look, like we, uh, including Fedora Infra, Fedora is still on 2.9 as well, because uh, the main issue was no European package anymore. Uh, at the moment, this is something that should be worked on. So uh, Ansible upstream decided to stop providing European package. Uh, and provide just the package through to to PyPy to bit, um, and so um, I worked. Well, this is a proposal that I have to work with Kevin Fancy from uh, Fedora Project, uh, and also the Ansible package maintainer for Apple and Fedora, just to have a look at what's needed and what is the best way to package. Because as David explained, there is the Ansible base or Ansible core depending on the version and the. Uh, the pack, the, co the community, the collection, all together is one package. So it's confusing a, a little bit. And when you understand the core and base plus community means Ansible 3. And so 2.11 plus community is Ansible 4. Um, this is um, how we should have a look at how to package it. And um, there is, that's, this is one aspect. So lack of European package at the moment something that should be worked on. And the third thing is the way to call also the modules, because uh, we all start to, to call in our roles and playbook just the name of the module. But now everything is namespace. Uh, 
meaning that uh, you probably, if you want to start using also the collection correctly, you need also to change the, the way you call the modules in your um, in your Ansible playbook and role. So this is the other part to have a look. But um, as soon as we have packages and uh, we just it can be just a massive change in a specific branch, see that it's compatible. Um, I don't see any reason to not migrate. This is clearly something uh, we want to do this year, clearly. I hope that is that uh, this answer the question, uh, Miguel. Yep. Um, so I'll, uh, I, we, we have questions for you, uh, Fabian. Uh, any, any preference between Gitcrypt or eCryptFS? Um, just to be honest, uh, I, I don't have uh, a clue. Uh, we started with Gitcrypt some time ago. We even we were already using Gitcrypt uh through for puppets in the past <laughs> um so that's that's just what we default to when we switch from puppet to ansible for to git crypt i saw some other way to crypt uh git repositories um ansible vault is nice but it has some limitation uh git crypt is nice if you just want to use a gpg public key and give access to a new collaborator uh, I never use eCryptFS, so um, I have no preference in the sense that the only one I know is Gitcrypt so far. Uh, so that was Pat asking, by the way. Um, we have a question from Anonymous. Uh, I got moved to Matrix instead of Slack. So I think that was in reference to when I was mentioning that um, our, uh, has an IRC channel in Freenode that is bridged to a Slack instance. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't mind metrics at all. I'm just one person, and uh, maintaining the non-code related infrastructure around an open source project is actually time consuming. You know, I mentioned Twitter, uh, IRC, Slack. Uh, it, you know, it kind of adds up over time. So I don't particularly mind metrics, and if someone wants to. You know, do that. Uh, I don't mind. Uh, there's, I count, 242 people on Slack right now, and uh, about 30 on IRC. So it, you know, it just gives you an idea. Uh, I prefer IRC personally, uh, but you know, I recognize that people want to chat elsewhere, and I don't. I don't have a strong opinion about that at all. Um, another question. Um, on making Ansible console output structured text. Um, I would like more details on that, but there are different ways to influence how Ansible will write its output to the console. I know that um, some people like the YAML um, output, outputs plugin. So it, instead of writing uh, pseudo JSON to console, it will write YAML instead, which is a bit more say human readable uh, but if you don't like yaml uh, then you know you're you're in for something um uh Onu Raup asks um can we use ara without the server and still save the reports to sql databases so i can use my own ui yes you can so you still you still need uh, the server to record the data, but once it's there, you can have any front end you want as long as it knows how to talk to the API, right? That's where that's why there's an API, in fact, so you can actually do these things. Um, in fact, there is, uh, and now it's not it's not maintained and it's fact it's broken right now. But there is an Ara web project that is a JavaScript interface built with uh, Patternfly and React that knows how to talk to the API and you know get playbooks and do stuff with them and you know display them on a web interface. Um, so yeah, by all means, um, that's why there's an API. So uh, you don't you don't need to expose the reporting web interface that's built in if you don't want to. Uh, so a follow-up to that question. Uh, no, there is no way to avoid it, Django. Um, that it's, it's Django that provides it, it. Ara exposes as little Django as possible, right? Django is just a way to talk to the database. It's a way to implement the 
uh, the API with Jinko REST framework. Um, it tries to minimize the impact of needing to run Django. Um, you know, it, it doesn't expose all the settings. It doesn't expose all the, you know, tweaks and knobs. Um, so hopefully, you know, it doesn't get in your way too much. Um, but if, if there's ever an issue, you know, reach out and we'll talk about it. Um, funny, funny story. Uh, before the rewrite to Ara uh, 1.0, uh, the backend was actually Flask, um, but for a number of reasons, um, you know, we went to Django. Uh, I'm less mistaken, I think. Oh, we have we have uh, a last question here, maybe. Uh, Rich, uh, it's okay if I can, if I take it. Uh, Miguel Miguel asks. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, Miguel asks um, basically, um, is there uh, recommendations uh, regarding uh, a backend uh, in terms of performance uh, for the database? So SQL uh, SQLite is really good enough for, uh, like Fabian mentioned, right? It's whatever prejudice people might have against SQLite, it's actually pretty good. Um, where it tends to fall off is in terms of concurrency. So it doesn't tolerate very well when you have multiple processes or multiple threads uh, trying to read and write stuff you know, with table locks and stuff. So when, when you do need to scale beyond just one machine reporting, say you have multiple machines reporting playbooks left and right, you might want to consider uh, MySQL or uh, MariaDB or um, Plus gray. So in terms of performance, I have not formally benchmarked them. Um, uh, so I, I would expect MySQL and PostgreSQL to be uh, on fairly equal footing. We don't use the R doesn't use like um, backend specific features like uh, I know PostgreSQL has some uh, features that MySQL doesn't, but you know, for the, for the feature set, we used uh, this something that's supported by all the backends. Um, so go with what you like and prefer and already have maybe, um, you know, for some people that run AWX or Tower, they're already running a Postgre for that. So they don't go out of their way to spin up a MySQL machine. They already have a Postgre SQL one. We seem to be at the end of the questions and at the end of the time. Thank you so much, both of you, for this presentation. And thank you, everyone, for participating and bringing your questions. We now have a short break before our next session, which will be Pat Rehecki talking about uh, binary compatibility in CentOS Stream. And uh, thanks again. Thanks, Rich. Uh, and thanks, Fabian. See you guys around.